You all right? My name's Paul, I've got autism, and I make random videos based on my version of autism and the way my head works. And I stick the videos on the internet just in case you fancy giving them a watch. Hope you're all doing all right. Um, there's no waffle this week because I want to just get straight into this topic. For the reason being, I've had this sat in my to cover folder forever. <laughs> and uh, it was about, I was about 10 videos in and I got an email just asking me with a bit of information in there as well. But the point of the email was, can you be autistic and happy? And it, it bothered me when I read it. I did respond by email, but um, I've not just ignored someone for a year. But it, it's a bother when you think that there are people out there who wonder if you can be happy or, you know, positive when you have autism. Because I, and you can see why it's a problem. The, you know, we live in a society that we don't usually fall in under a lot of the brackets of what's been created. We don't see the logic in a lot of things. We don't understand why we have to care about certain things. One of the things that will forever bamboozle me is I don't care if people go out, have a great time, enjoy clubbing, enjoy going to restaurants, enjoy art galleries can use public transport, whatever it might be. I'm, I'm not bothered. Have a nice time. Be happy, healthy, consensual, legal. And so long as you're not hurting anybody else, jobs are good. But when I don't want to do those things and I want to stay reclusive and I, <laughs> I want to stay indoors and I don't want to come with you, I don't want to go to art galleries, I don't find the interest in half of the things you do, I don't want to go there on public transport, I don't go to London, I get questioned as if I'm doing something wrong or there's something incorrect in my wiring. Why don't I enjoy it? You know, there's something wrong with me for not enjoying it. So there is this, there is this thing that people assume that we are unhappy as well, that there is a problem. And I guess it's just taken me a long time to get around to do the video because I've not been able to find a way to do it. But I think it's very important to try and do a video on because I hate the idea that there's people out there who don't think you can be happy and have autism. Now, this isn't going to be a happy, fun, shiny, friendly type of video. I'm going to try and pick apart me as I've gone through the years to see where did I find my happiness and was it even there anyway when I thought I found it, you know, and um, try and think of, of whether I'm happy today because there's no point in wondering if I was happy. It's about today, isn't it? It's not what could have been. It's what's happening. Because I, I couldn't be miserable today but think, oh, at least I was happy in my 20s. What difference does that make? It's about our field today, isn't it? And what can I do for the future? And how, I, how can I make sure I'm dialed in to look after the things that would affect my happiness? You know, because if I make bad decisions, I can't expect good things to happen in the end. If I don't put the hard work in, I can't expect an easy life. Although these days you put the hard work in, you've still got a hard life. So it's, uh, it's just not as hard if you work hard, is it? But um, yeah, so let's, let's have a go at trying to go through some of my history to see if there was happiness in there. So when I look back and I think of sort of leaving school because school doesn't count, you know, you in, you're under somebody else's control consistently. You live with your parents. You are under the care of teachers. You can't go anywhere. You can't do anything. I'm not playing that one. I want to think of just after that. So when I was about 16, I had a friend called Alan. And Alan worked at the airport. And he was in my school as well. And we got on well. He was a nice guy. I don't speak to him anymore because he became a marine biologist. Got too good for the rest of us. Got a posh accent from somewhere. And don't speak to anyone anyone anymore. Um, but if you're ever watching, Alan, I, I, you know, I hope you're all right, mate. But um, <laughs> he would, because he was, he was a good guy, he worked at the airport. And on weekends, his parents owned a caravan in Wales. And what they, would, what, what they allowed is that we could go. So um, on weekends, every now and again, Alan would pay for me and another friend, buy us coach tickets, and we'd get there. And all we had to do was pay our way while we were there, you know. Um, but he would make sure we, we could get there and get back. And he was, he was really good about it. And uh, he never had to do that, but he did. 
And me and my other friend, when we were there, we were walking around the town. And he goes, you know what, bro? You know what we should do? We should, like, we should move down here, mate. We should, you know, it's near the sea. It's a place nobody knows us. We should get a job in a supermarket. We should get a, a two-bedroom flat. We should kit it out. We should, you know, like get guitars on the walls. We should write music down here. Um, be able to go out to the pubs and the clubs and all that. Be, you know, it's a new way of life. Start fresh somewhere else, bro. And that is exactly how he spoke. I'm not just putting an accent on for any uh, effect. Um, and I was well up for that. Well up for it. That was, I believed if I got a flat with my friend in that area to do the things he said, then I would be happy. You know, and I, 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 I would, uh, you know, he doesn't know this, but I was like going around all the estate agents looking for places to rent. I was looking at which shops were hiring, getting application forms. I was going above and beyond off a very quick whim because I was very under the impression that what anybody says with 1% conviction means it's going to happen. It's just the way I was wired. And I've had to teach myself as the years have gone on that that's absolutely not the case at all. And it's horrible, but I have to, in a way, Tell myself that no matter what anybody ever says, it's not coming off. It's not happening. If they're in control of it, I've just got to go, whatever, that's not happening. And that way, if it ever does happen, I can be pleasantly surprised. But you know what? Having that negative version of an attitude has actually done me well through the years because of how many times I've been let down. But back when I was like 16, I thought we were going to do it. So I... The thing I thought would bring me happiness never came off, so I wasn't happy because I thought that's what I needed to be happy. I needed to be living there. I needed to be in that area. I needed to be living with my friend. We needed to be writing music. We needed to be doing everything he said to bring the happiness, and because it never came off, I wasn't happy. Um, and then when I look in sort of my early 20s, I started, or 19, I started working away. So I went away, um, landed very well when I first started working away. And uh, well, the very first start of it was horrific, but sort of three weeks in was much better or a month later was better because I went somewhere else. Um, and I ended up like living and knocking around with three guys from uh, Newcastle and berwick upon Tweed. And it's really hit and miss who you connect with and who you get on with. A lot of people work away because they're running away from something. Drug dealers, debts, whatever it might be, they can't get a job at home, so they're doing this. Uh, whereas we all just fancied working away. And the fact that we, I just got, I don't know, we just, we just, we just ended up being very good friends while we, while we worked away. And we would have every Thursday off together. So it never mattered for me how busy it was. Horrible things customers would say. Or anything, all that mattered to me was this friendship, this group of guys, me and them three, me, Baz, Matty, and Brian. Us four, the four horsemen, that's what I needed, that's what brought me happiness, and that was, that was great. But then as the years went on, Brian didn't come to one of the parks that we were working away on. So that instantly broke us up because I was going to be living with Brian in, on one of the parks and he didn't come because he thought it was two in the middle of nowhere. So it was like, oh no, we're, the four of us are not going to be together anymore. But it, it was like, okay, well, I'm going to have to live with someone else because Matty and Baz were brothers, still are. Um, so they were always going to be living together, you know what I mean? And uh, so I had to live with someone new and that wasn't as good. And um, then about a month in, Matty went back because Matty was dating this girl, didn't want to, it was really hard for her to get there because it was in the middle of nowhere. So then I moved in with Baz and then it got better again because I, I was living with someone I knew. It was a better caravan as well because we were all living in caravans on the holiday parks. And me and Baz got on better than ever and it was great. But then years went on and it, it just kept changing. And what was bringing me happiness was then also causing me, me sadness because I thought that was great, you know, and, and what's, what that sort of did, because I was put, putting my thought and energy into that, that when it, I got into my later 20s and 
I was kind of the only one left really doing it. It was, uh, you know, Baz was working for someone else by then. And it, it was just sort of, I realized that the job was horrible. <laughs> I realized that I absolutely hated the job and I didn't like where I was living. I didn't like most of the other people around me. Most. I liked some of them. So it, it, it wasn't nice. And then I ultimately ended up going back to Manchester and everything that I thought was bringing me happiness through a chunk of my 20s was, was gone. You know, and so, so that wasn't good either. What I thought was bringing me happiness actually wasn't. You know, and then late 20s or early 30s, it was about finding that job when I was back home because it was hard because I'd been working seasonal work. I'd been working just a certain type of job. And when I'd got back home, people I knew we would try to keep in touch with were all doing something different. They had kids and nobody would ever come out anymore and nobody would ever just meet up anymore. Nobody had any stories to tell either because they stayed where they were. I was out doing all sorts of mad stuff and they just, it's like you just saw them an hour later rather than three years later, you know? Um, and I just felt myself falling into that category of nothingness. You know, I'm just going to find a dead end job, I'm going to work it. And then what's, what's the to do from there? So my sort of early 30s, end, end of my 20s, early 30s, I'd also had a bit of a bad accident in, the, in the, the, that time as well, which wasn't fun. Uh, it took a while to get over with me back. Um, but I was, I was miserable around that time. Very miserable. Very what's the point? You know, because a lot of people do say that in autism as well. It's what is the point? You know, this world's not designed for us. Nothing brings me happiness. Everything winds me up. What is the point of being here? And as much as I know that mentality isn't real, because that's just a sign of poor mental health, there's a, a million reasons to be here. And the most important one is you do what you want to do. <laughs> there's, there's a big clue for one of the things I do today. You know, I, I'm over being feeling selfish for looking after me. I'm over it. And what a difference that's made. But a lot of people, like I say, it's a sign of poor mental health. If you wonder why you're here, you know, just get on with it. You know, you're not part of a higher structure. You just are who you are. You're a grain of salt in the ocean. You've just got to be happy with that. And I, I just went through a really bad time where I felt that way too. You know, and then as I got older and I was into my later thirties, and I'd, I'd found, I'd, I basically went to this interview. For this company where it was 16 hours for 12 weeks and it was I went to an interview and it turned out that I was not qualified or competent at all to do any of what they were offering but this guy liked my enthusiasm for the industry and he offered me like I said 16 hours for 12 weeks just to shadow him do little bits and bobs help tidy up and brush around the edges of the job he was doing and that job ultimately became 40 hours within a couple of weeks and I was there for eight years and then became better at what he did within a couple of months uh, <laughs> because I was just so invested and he just wasn't bothered. He was very out the book. I was very building talk to me like I was some sort of building whisperer or something. Um, and I still do exactly the same methodology now. I let the building talk to me. Um, so, yeah, once I'd sort of got that job and, and I started having a steady income coming in, I could then reassess where I was and make better decisions. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, when I was at school, I had the world at my feet. I had no reason to be happy or unhappy. I was just, what could go wrong? Everything can go right. Everything can go wrong. Nothing's going right. It didn't matter because I was young. It was fine. But then as I sort of got older, you know, and I was working away, I, for me to have happiness, I needed those friends for my happiness. That happiness didn't come from me. It came from being near, around, conversating, doing things with friends, with those friends. But I was still carefree, still early 20s. I could still do whatever I wanted. But then as I got into the late 20s and the friends were gone and they were having families and settling down and they were basically doing things I did not want to do. I didn't want to have kids and 
you start to then get this weird little conflict going on in yourself like i don't want to do it but to sort of stay included and invested with everyone and what they're doing maybe i should do it too and i'm so glad i didn't listen to me because that would have been the worst thing for me to do because it wasn't my design it wasn't who i was still isn't and i'm still very happy with not having children and i always will be you know the people who argue the biological imperative and research that's your re that, that research didn't include me so it might say you are only here to procreate I'm not, trust me. I didn't ask to be here, but now I'm here. I'm going to enjoy myself. But I was feeling down because everyone was having the children and having, you know, not, not, not the fact they were getting married, but, you know, they were, they were getting a house. They had a partner. They were moving on and they were doing things at the pace that you sort of expected to do it. And I was feeling not left out. I felt like I was standing out. And because I don't like attention, I felt like I was getting the attention as to why I wasn't doing things. Like friends were trying to set me up with their their like their partners' friends, and I didn't want that. You know, it, it was just a horrible place to be, and I was just getting further and further and further from from happiness. You know, and in my thirties, when I was helping others move forward and achieve what they wanted to achieve i was being used for i was being manipulated for 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 better better youth of uh, better use of it i was being manipulated for what i could offer people so they could benefit and i you know i i i i, I tried to help people i tried to look after people i i wanted the best for people because i thought if i did that then i would be useful if i helped I, I always wanted to be the second to somebody's first if somebody was a boss i wanted to be an assistant you know i didn't want to be the boss i wanted to be the good backup you know the super sub the person who could stand in if needed but i'm quite happy for them to get all the uh the attention and the glory i didn't want it but I, I always wanted to be the backup but what what happened in a certain job is i was used for that you know my good intention was manipulated so where I was looking for calmness from doing that, all it brought me was chaos. And I did a job where I worked for a friend um, and I was given all the horrible shifts and we never spent time together, which was you know, one of the reasons I went. It was nice to be around the friend, a bit like the early 20s and being around those friends. You know, I kind of wanted that to happen, but it didn't. So therefore, because I had a thought of what I thought I wanted, my happiness was never coming. You know, so what I'm saying is from sort of leaving school to mid or early 30s, I never got any happiness because I was pinning it on everything else except me. I was pinning it on people I knew, situations I was in, observing other people's design, you know, their biological imperatives that they feel and their societal norms that they want to live by like getting married and things like that and what's crazy is you know you, you get older time moves forward but these people who were doing that that i felt should i be doing that too barely any of them are together anymore <laughs> and all these guys are balder than i am even though i'm very bald it's just this doesn't look it from this angle but there's a solar panel on my head at the back um you know, they're just, they're more miserable. They're, they're miserable. Whereas I was struggling to find happiness. Now, if I, I'd rather be in the limbo stage than be miserable, especially over uh, situations that I've built myself and put myself in. Um, but now, I, you know, what? Let, let, if that's enough sort of talking of history and what I was trying to do and where was, where was happiness, I was expecting happiness to find me, but I needed to find it. So, the thing I've done, the thing I do, is I realize that happiness is a state. It is something, it is an, it's an emotion, it's something you have to feel. But it's also something that cannot be sustained. So I had to redesign what my thought process was around happiness. I wanted to be happy, but what did happiness mean to me? 
what is it? What was it? How I interpret it will be very different from how you do. I'm happy if I hit three green lights in a row when I'm driving. Love it. Other people, you know, if you ever watch that My Sweet 16, for example, you've got a kid crying because the Mercedes the dad bought them was beige and not blue. <laughs> you know, there's, there's differences in levels, isn't there? But for me, happiness, like I say, was, is, is the emotion. And if I'm happy today and then tomorrow someone I care about passes away, how can I be happy? How can I have happiness in me when something has then made me sad? The opposite of happiness. I can't be happy if I'm sad. So then everything I build and work for to try and become happy is gone. So what was the point in trying to be happy? I'm just a simple man sat before you, bumping his gums, talking to people who might never watch the video. That's all I am. But I'm humble with that. Like I said, I appreciate green lights. I appreciate comfy pajamas. I appreciate fresh bedding. I appreciate my favorite weather, which is rain. I appreciate hearing it on my window more than you'll ever know. So one thing I miss about living in a caravan when it used to rain heavy and you were lying there in that tin box and you could hear it and you're in bed all snuggly. It was the best. That brought me a good feeling. So what I did to stop being brought down, to stop feeling bad, to stop relying on others, to stop feeling bad if they let me down, to stop pinning it on a scenario, is I realized that I don't need to be happy. I also don't want to be sad. I don't want to be upset. I don't want to be down. I don't want to be depressed. I don't want to be in low mood, but low mood happens. So does depression. Can't get away from them. But the one thing I want to be and need to be, and it's ever since I started looking after me as a person and realized that it doesn't mean you're selfish, I started to find the thing I need. And the thing I need thing I want is contentment. I just want to be content because you can be content and someone could still pass away you care about. And it doesn't mean it has to disrupt your contentment. You can still mourn them. You can still feel their loss. You can still attend their funeral. You can still miss them when they're gone, but you can still be content. You can still you know, and the only way to be content is to set your life up for that. And that's why it's so important you don't feel selfish for looking after you. If you look after you and you're doing nothing that's going to be detrimental to anyone, it's healthy, it's, you know, not to the detriment of others, it's not breaking any laws, you've got to set your life up for you. You know, stepping on people, that's a bad thing. That's absolutely not included. That's what I mean. You can't do things that are detrimental to others, but you can still be that version of selfish that makes sure you are all right. And when I started doing that, I realized that I wasn't being selfish. I was actually doing something I'd never, ever done before from being a teenager, 20s, early 30s. I was making sure I was all right too. Something I'd never done before. I was doing everything for everyone else, wanting the best for everyone else, happy to be the second for somebody's first. And I got stepped on, used, abused, you know, manipulated, um, ignored. Once they'd got the use out of me, they moved on, didn't look back. But when I started looking after me, I realized that that's not selfish to actually make sure you're all right too. You know, and it might sound stupid that I had to get to my early 30s, mid 30s to realize that but it did take that long. And I'm glad it took a time because otherwise I could still be floating through without having that realization, no matter how obvious it might sound to you as I talk to you. You might have had it when you were six. But for me, I had to be that age to realize that I don't need happiness. I need contentment. Some other people might need to be happy. I don't. I need contentment. I need to design my life in such a way that the things I can control 
I do control and I control them within an inch of their life. And I make sure that it is well considered. There's no room for error. And if there is error, there has to be error, then the margin for it is very small and the fallout is very light. I make sure that things that could bring me worry, I don't have to worry about them too much. I make sure that things that would make me sad are not included in my life. You know, things that are out of my control, I push them as far away as possible because if I can't do something about it, then what's the point in me thinking about it? So I don't have Facebook. It's other people's lives. It's not my control. And if they're having a great time or a bad time, what can I do? You know, and if they are a friend, I can always offer a shoulder to cry on, of course. I couldn't. I always would. But if, it, if they needed help from me, they wouldn't be putting it on a social media platform. They'd be reaching out directly, wouldn't they? So I've made sure that I work consistently in a workplace. I make sure I don't rock the boat when a boat doesn't need to be rocked. I make sure I hold my tongue instead of speaking with things I disagree with and don't like because maybe someone else will say it. Maybe what I might want to say is based off emotion rather than thinking about it and revisiting it later. I treat my life like I'm being recorded with everything I say. I don't send that email straight away if I'm angry. I leave it till the day after, reread it. 100 out of 100 times, I delete it and rewrite it again. Because I don't want to create drama because drama is for TV. It's not for real life. I have to adjust my way. And it does take constant monitoring, constant watching. You're always dialed in. You're never allowed to be on autopilot. But everything I do is to try and make my life as stress-free as possible, even though it will always bring stress. You know, and you've got to work hard for an easy life, but nothing's easy anymore. But at least working hard makes it easier. Just trying to reduce the difficulty setting on everything I do in life by putting the work in for it. By paying attention to who I am, what I need and what I want. Me, Paul, what he wants, not what everybody else wants, not what a trend wants, what I want. I'm not going to say these things because I'm going to get shouted at if I don't. I'm not going to answer to you in this way because I'll get shouted at if I don't. No, I'm not doing anything rude, harmful, disrespectful, or illegal in life. But I want to be healthy, content, and left alone. And that's the way I am doing everything in life. And because I am so separate from the world and reclusive from it, by paying attention to all of these things that I've done in order, to try and reduce and create control measures towards it has in turn increased my contentment because there isn't room for damage, carnage, chaos, or lack of control because I've stopped caring about the things that I can't control anymore. Every now and again, something will seep through and it'll bother me, but not for long. But when I look at my life and the things that I can control, there is maybe two things that I've still got which I've not mastered yet, but they're not big things and they don't affect my mood too much. One of them is my weight. I can go on a diet if it bothered me that much. And the other one is I'm going bald. Can't help it. Oh, my teeth are moving a lot. <laughs> so I need a brace. And I'm going to go back to the dentist and I ate dentists. You know, so there's all sorts. But when you look at the grand scheme of things, I've got to go through short pain with a dentist with a few needles. Get over it, Paul. You're a grown boy. You know, that's what I've got to tell myself when I'm outside of that remit. But if I'm actually at a dentist, I'm bricking it. You know, I'm going bald. I can shave it all off. I can live with it looking like it does for now. Or I can, you know, be vain and go and get hair plugs. Who knows? Um, and, I've, and for me, weight, you know, I've literally now just started to lose a few pounds because I've I've booked a holiday, but I'll maybe talk about that another time. Um, so I just want to be a bit smaller because I've got a load of board shorts. And it'd be a shame to buy new ones when I've already got clothes sitting there. You know, but they don't bother me to an extent that it affects my mood. So I don't have to put too much thought in them either. So for me, it's not about the pursuit of happiness. It's the need for contentment. And I think that's what I need to carry me through. And hopefully for the rest of my days, I'll still be anxious. I'll still be stressed. But if I can be content in there as well, I'll take it. But thanks for watching. And until next time, keep smiling.